Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Ian Nagoski. I'm a music researcher. I live in Baltimore, Maryland. This is my basement. Welcome to it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some old records. I'm a person who's been involved in uh, listening to, thinking about, accumulating uh, early 20th century recordings for 25 years or so. And uh, what they are are records that were made by immigrants to the United States um, in the early 20th century. In looking at them and researching them in particular, I've been uh, trying to learn their stories and the contexts in which they lived and doing reissues of them and publishing research when I can. Um, I made my best attempt to have this uh, sound as good as possible. I went out, I bought some stuff to make the audio good and it didn't work. So what we have is a kind of compromise. I hope it goes okay. Um, I'm gonna uh, rely on the thumbs up from the gentleman behind the uh, sound booth there to let me know that this is all going fine so far. Is that correct? Yes, he's giving me the thumbs up, good. So uh, normally when I talk about this stuff, um, for 20 years, I've been gathering people around and playing them old records and telling them stories about them. Um, I don't know if you're there. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know what's going on at all. Um, so I'm just gonna be here in my basement yelling at my computer, hoping that it, uh, that it all works out. Um, it's mostly not going to be records. I'm mostly not going to be playing uh, music for you. A few things, and I'm going to be truncating them, which I don't normally do. I try and play whole sides and end a whole song to, right, one of the main purposes of all this is to dignify the lives of some people whose music has not been well remembered. Um, but instead, what I'm going to be doing is a lot of talking and some kind of show and tell. Since uh, time is short, got about 55 minutes. Uh, to get through a bunch of stories that I'd like to share with you. Um, but I'm going to begin actually by uh, reading you a poem that was uh, published, uh, written just a few months after I was born. It's called uh, Ordinance on Arrival uh, by a woman named uh, Naomi Lazard, uh, November 12th, 1975. It goes, uh, welcome to you who've managed to get here. It's been a terrible trip. You should be happy to have survived it. Not many do. You'd like a bath and a hot meal, good night's sleep. Some of you need medical attention. None of them are available. These are things that have always been in short supply and now they are impossible to obtain. Addenda. This is not a temporary situation. It is permanent. Our condolences on your disappointment it is not our responsibility. Everything you have heard about this place is false. It is not our fault you have been deceived. That you have ruined your health getting here and for reasons no one can control, there is no vehicle out. So on that cheery note, I'm gonna be talking to you about immigration to the United States. This is a subject that um, I did not learn about at all in school growing up. I was born in 1975. Um, yeah, we, there are flashes of imagery that come to uh, any given American about what immigration has been like. Um, we, we don't learn about it in school. We don't know much about who we are or how we got here. There's something about the Mayflower. There's something about some other people came, maybe some Irish and then some Jews and there's New York City, and then we all went west, and then here we are, and now uh, America has a major problem with immigration. We have a major problem with the understanding of immigration. Our current administration is um, opposed to immigration of all kinds um, and use all sorts of ways of describing it. And when they are uh, speaking to the New York Times, when they are giving press conferences about immigration, uh, the people in charge have often been able to just tap dance all over the heads of the reporters because the reporters don't know the history of American immigration. So in order to tell you a little bit about these records, I'm first going to give you a kind of a crash course in the history of American immigration as I have learned it as a result of needing to know about these old records that I will eventually be playing for you. 
Um, so it all begins uh, with uh, the passing of the Constitution um, and the first naturalization law on March 26th, 1790, 13 years after the Constitution went into effect, which allowed uh, immigration to anyone who was free, whatever that is, white, whatever that is, and persons, males, being of good character, whatever that is. So a lot of big open-ended questions, but anybody could come, right? Free, white, male, good character, open-ended. You can come, you can become a citizen, you can vote. And that's where it gets complicated immediately. Five years later, uh, there's a restriction passed that says that uh, immigrants have to be in the country for uh, uh, five years uh, in order to be able to vote. Now, why? Why was there a restriction that you had to be here five years? Because we just fought a war in order to have this new democracy. And if you're gonna get a vote, you gotta show that you're invested, that you're really here to stay, right? So you gotta be here five years. Then they revised it, so you had to be here 10 years, and then they immediately turned it back, so it had to be five years, because 10 years was too much. Already there's a back and forth, and that's the history of immigration legislation in the United States, is that it's a, a dialogue and a back and forth of periods of sanity and insanity, insanity and insanity, right? Um, middle of the 19th century, two massive waves of immigration happened. The first, the largest, five million people between 1840 and uh, 1890 arrive, all who speak German. The largest wave of immigration in, the U in US history per capita. The next big one is three million people, right about the same time, a little bit after, and they were Irish. The Irish posed a specific peculiar problem in that they were largely Catholic papists. So the establishment of the United States were wasps. They were um, English, basically. And we had coming in a group of people with a different religion that uh, the power structure said, um, them, really? Are we gonna let them vote in our country, in our election? You know, my grandfather died for this country. My uncle lost a leg. You know, this was very important to us and we fought and we won. And furthermore, I've made some money over here. Are we gonna let the Catholics vote here? Mm, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. So that gives rise to this massive wave of xenophobia and uh, voter suppression. So for instance, here in Baltimore, uh, there was a series of uh, uh, voting riots in the 1850s. There's a very good book called Violence in America, A Documentary History by Richard Hofstetter and Michael Wallace that describes the rise of the Native American Party as it was known. Nothing to do with American Indians. Uh, they were also referred uh, vernacularly as the Know Nothing Party. After 1854, the sh they sharply increased the severity of election riots. Innumerable street gangs, the plug uglies, the rough skins, the rip raps, and the blood tubs were used by the Know Nothing Party to terrorize immigrants. Gangs developed several methods of eliminating opponents. The blood tubs, for example, got their name from a technique of intimidation here in Baltimore. Uh, they would go get tubs of blood from local butcher shops, and then on election day, uh, heave the tubs of blood over Irishmen's heads and then chase them down the street with knives in full view of everybody else. So all the other Irish would go, nah, maybe it's not worth me voting. Maybe everything's fine and I'll just let them run their country the way they want to, right? But in this way, there were uh, riots between 1857 and 1858, 1859 that resulted in uh, uh, hundreds of deaths on the streets of Baltimore. Um, I, I'm sorry, dozens of deaths, hundreds of people injured. Uh, there was cannon fire in the city. Um, yeah, it was chaotic. And uh, they won. They won local, state, and presidential elections by doing this. Voter suppression has always been the name of the game when it comes to immigrants. Who gets to vote and who doesn't? Um, 1870, the 14th Amendment 
uh, addresses naturalization uh, specifically in light of the freed slaves, but uh, more generally it's addressed to voter intimidation and groups like the new Ku Klux Klan who started out as a voter intimidation group, right? So um, 1882, we passed the first ever legislation excluding a group of people saying, nope, you can't be part of us. You're not allowed to vote. The Chinese Exclusion Act, where we said a whole group of people by ethnicity, by nationality, were not allowed to participate in the democracy. And it opened this can of worms that has been creeping and crawling all over us ever since. Um, the uh, justification for excluding an entire ethnicity, language group, nation, race, uh, was that they were by nature uh, uh, monarchists and pagans and would never assimilate and never become American, right? And people went with it and it stayed on the books for a long time, decades and decades and decades. So right at that time, immigration swells to its, again, largest size. Between 1880 and 1924, um, America sees its largest wave of immigration. Um, during that period, uh, we erect a big statue that the French give us uh, on uh, uh, Liberty Island uh, off of Manhattan um, next to Ellis Island, which was the largest port of entry in the United States. In 1903, we installed a bronze plaque, a site-specific poem at the base of the statue, a poem written by a woman named Emma Lazarus. Uh, it's called The New Colossus. You may, have, you may know it. Um, it's a uh, uh, two stanzas. Uh, the second one is very famous. It goes, keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she, with silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So that becomes this mission statement for immigration in America that we all do learn in school. We go, as I'm growing up, America is a place that welcomes immigrants. We believe that about ourselves. Well, yes and no. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So during that period, 1890 to 1907, the poems installed 1903. 1907 is the single largest year of immigration in American history. Now, the number of foreign born people in the United States uh, for 60 years, between 1860 and 1920, remains steady, more or less. It is almost always 14% of the population of the US. It so happens, the current percentage of foreign born individuals in the United States is about 14%, just under. But then things get complicated. So I'm gonna play you a, a little bit of a song uh, to talk about that complication. This is a, a song that was first recorded in 1920, right as anxiety is beginning to take over the American population about the changing nature and quality of the uh, immigrants that are surrounding native born people here. Um, it was originally recorded by a woman named Nora Bays, who was uh, the Taylor Swift of the uh, late teens and early twenties. Um, her biggest hit was uh, about for, uh, the First World War. Over there, over there, da da da. Anyway, big hit, still known by some people. Um, it was then re recorded by Eddie Cantor in 1921. Uh, Ed Meeker recorded it for Edison in 1922. And in 1924, there's this version, which is my personal favorite by the Duncan Sisters. It's a song called uh, The Argentines, the Portuguese, and the Greeks. And uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, listen to a little bit of that one there. You're gonna hear me fits, uh, fuddle a little bit with the, uh, the sound here, but yeah. Columbus discovered America in 1492. Then came the English and the French, the Scotsman and the Jew. Then came the Dutch and the Irishman to help the country grow. Yeah. 
They don't know the law, yet they vote in the country of the free. Now, the funny thing, when we start to sing, my country tis of thee, none of us know the words but the Argentines and the Portuguese and the Greeks. Okay. American song, right? Here's the British sheet music for it. About a year later. Um, the Duncan sisters were kind of a, a Topsy and Eva vaudeville act. Uh, one wore blackface, the other didn't, and they did this kind of uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, routine thing. Uh, I'm, I have sheet music of them as well. I'm not going to show it because it's upsetting to some people, the whole blackface thing, but there it is. Anyway, we've got a, uh, a rather interestingly genderqueer um, sort of uh, uh, West Side London uh, version of it here. Uh, there's modified English uh, referential lyrics, the Normans with William the Conqueror first came to England shores, then came the Danish and the Dutch and the Greeks and the Turks in scores, then came the French and Italians to help the country grow, and still they keep on coming now everywhere you go. Same song was recorded uh, in London, as a matter of fact, by a pair of African American guys from Washington, D.C., uh, who had immigrated. Um, it so happens. Now, there was a Ed Meeker's version of it includes a bunch of accusations of, well, first of all, alcoholism. Uh, they all love their liquor. They don't give a nickel for the stuff that runs in rivers, brooks, and creeks. And an extra verse of sexual anxiety. Uh, I'm in love with the sweetest girl. The sweetest girl loves me. And though she's sweet and heartfully, our ideals don't agree. I love to dine in the club cafe, paraffin and wine. My girl has a different frame and she just loves to dine with the Argentine and the Portuguese and the Armenians and the Greeks. He loves to rummage down among the garlic and her breath will not be over when she speaks. Now the thing I dread is the year we're wed and our child has made three weeks. It will look just like all the Argentines and the Portuguese and the Greeks. Paraffin, by the way, is a viscous white slippery substance used in making candle wax. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's uh, you will not replace us. It's anxiety about the fact that America has this wave of immigrants who are coming mostly from Eastern Europe, um, Slavs, Jews, uh, Italy, and uh, other places where people tend to be Orthodox, Jewish, Catholic, and browner, darker, darker eyes, swarthier features. Um, yeah, people are uptight about the fact that you get on the subway and the seats are taken by people who are they look, they are not as blonde. They are not as waspy looking. America has basically always had three ideas of immigration that have run more or less concurrently and more or less in and out of favor. The first was, of course, Anglo conformism, where an immigrant is supposed to adopt as much of the style of being, the cultural norms of uh, the English as possible, as fast as possible conform to the Anglo thing. 
The next idea is um, the melting pot. The melting pot is the idea that, look, okay, everybody comes, and then after a while, you take on some of me, I take on some of you, our children get married. Next thing you know, who can tell the difference? We're all part of this big, wonderful blend that becomes our country, right? And the third idea is um, plurality, what we called in the 1990s, uh, what was that, um, um, you know, uh, multiculturalism. So it's basically like, you got your thing and you got your ways of your cultural thing, I got mine, and we live next to each other. We don't necessarily melting pot that much, but we're cool. We can all function together with some baseline understandings of how we operate. So those three ideas are running in tandem. Meanwhile, this song has a bunch of factual errors that are significant. Number one, the Argentines, the, okay, number one, there are no Argentines coming to America. None, zip, zero, zilch. Uh, nobody from Argentina came to the United States in the early 20th century. Uh, Argentina saw its own massive wave of inward immigration. Second of all, um, these are not the people who were collecting the rent and driving all the nice cars, uh, un unlike what the song has to say. And third of all, uh, Greeks in particular had been in the United States for a very long time, uh, since the 16th century. Uh, the first Greek coffee house in America was established in 1592 by a guy named Canopius from Crete. Uh, beginning of the 17th century, Greeks were established in Florida, New Orleans, Alaska. Uh, Early 19th century, James Monroe was in support of Greece's war of independence against the Ottoman Empire. 1857, uh, uh, Spiros Bozanos opened the Peloponnesus, which was the first Greek restaurant in New York City. So there have been Greeks for a while. Armenians first arrive 1618. Uh, by 1870, there are fewer than 70 Armenians in the US, but 1890, there are 3,000. And then 1894 to 1917, 30,000 Armenians arrive. So it's a lot more. Bunch of reasons for that. Some of them we'll get into, some of them we won't have time for. Um, so that song's 1924. And the reason I bring up 1924 is because that's the year that America took a massive left turn in its immigration policy. We had what was called the Johnson-Reed Act. The Johnson Reed Act was a, a set of quotas for who could arrive from what country, for every country on earth, how many people could come from every country, right? Where they got the numbers from was from a census from 1890. It was an overt attempt to reset America, the exact shade of white that it had been 30 years earlier. Is an overtly white supremacist, wasp supremacist uh, view of uh, what America should look like and feel like culturally. So for instance, uh, the numbers started out, 51,272 Germans were allowed to arrive each year. Uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, 34,007. Poland, 3,982. Italy, 3,854. Portugal, 503. Four, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, Bulgaria, Greece, Palestine, and Albania, 100 each. 100 people per year. 120 Armenians per year. Now, how did they pass this legislation? How did they convince America who were going through, Americans were going through this anxiety about the changing quality of American culture and our, our shade of white, um, was through science and through experts. So for instance, Harry H. Laughlin, uh, was born in 1880, uh, educated in Missouri, got a PhD from Princeton, spent his whole career as a, an academic going to prisons and mental hospitals, um, studying the number of uh, immigrants in each place. And his conclusion was that uh, people from Eastern and Southern Europe were vastly more inclined toward feeble-mindedness and criminality than people from Northern Europe. And he winds up publishing, for instance, this book, Immigration and Conquest, um, published by uh, the Special Committee of Immigration and Naturalization of the Chamber of Commerce of the State of New York in 1939. 
there's a compilation of his work where he concludes uh, the individual citizen of the United States as in every other immigrant receiving country must uh, add immigration as a concern to his active list of matters which require eternal vigilance. He goes on in particular to say that uh, a period of economic depression and unemployment is an excellent time for immigrant receiving country like the United States to take stock of its recent past immigration, to deport radically unworthy and in inadequate aliens, and to work out the assimilation of those individuals and families whom it desires to add to its future population as progenitors as future Americans. Um, he basically is making the argument, let's see, Immigration to the nation is closely comparable with a marriage of a marriageable youth of the family. Neither is a thing to be determined primarily for immediate position or economic advance. In the long run, both for the family and the nation, the addition, the, exception, the acceptance of the outside individual should depend on hereditary stuff, physical, mental, and moral. You have hereditary mental, moral, and physical attributes, he says out of which the newly added group member is made. So his basic argument is, would you want your daughter to marry one? He's coming from a farming culture and a, as an academic is a, a person who's beginning to understand Darwinism a little bit and getting it wrong. Uh, the eugenicist phase of social science. Um, so I'll play you a, a little bit of a record made in uh, 1927 by an Armenian in New York City, a guy named Nishan Kiljekian. Um, he was born in 1886 or 87, died in uh, 1962, arrived at Ellis Island November 13th, 1911 at the age of 25 from present day Alazik in Turkey, um, about 200 miles north of Aleppo. Uh, he joined his brother in Chelsea, Massachusetts, worked first as a barber and then a surveyor for the city of Medford, finally owned a mortuary. This is one of only six songs that he recorded. Um, it's called Uske Gukas, which means where do you come from? And out of all of the hundreds, thousands of recordings I've heard of Armenian uh, immigrants to the United States, uh, it is probably the only protest song. It's not the only song of complaint exactly, but it's certainly the only directly protest song. The lyrics were translated by a friend of mine uh, named Harry Kazelian, and they go, Oh, my America, open the closed door. My fiancé is still on the other side. Although I have a piece of bread, my mouth is dry, my eyes wet. Where did you come up with this quota? We're here, but where will they go? Meaning brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, still stuck on, on the other side. What home do we have and what income? We are left dazed and lost. Oh, my America, are you the only one that doesn't get it? The Armenian language isn't going to harm you. When we start to speak broken Armenian, the melting pot is ready for us. You sent money and missionaries and made us so polrod, which is a Armenian slur for Protestant. It sounds a little bit like a leper in Armenian. Made us so polrod. Come and be of aid to us. We are not foreigners to you. This is recorded uh, for a little label called Pharos Records in, um, in New York City that was run out of a jewelry and watch repair shop uh, run by the, the um, Vartasian brothers. I'll show you a picture of one of those records in a sec. But anyway, Nishan Kiljekian. Ich tu nun in Kinshasa, 
So there were tens of thousands of Armenians in the U.S. whose families needed out of the collapsing Ottoman Empire in the 1920s and uh, who couldn't come. One of the things that happens as a result of this is that uh, illegal immigration goes up. People find ways in through Cuba and whatever. Um, the violin player on that track may have been Nishan Kaljekian, who in fact did immigrate illegally through Cuba, made it up to Detroit within a few days, uh, tried to uh, get naturalized, couldn't, went to New York and lived as an illegal immigrant uh, for decades, uh, working at the Vartasian Brothers Jewelry and Watch Repair Shop as a diamond setter. He winds up recording, in fact, on um, the single most biggest selling uh, Turkish language record, uh, probably in American history, which was made by a Greek guy named uh, Achilles Poulos. Uh, this is it. It's called Nedim Gedim Amerikaya, Why I Came to America. Um, Poulos was an extraordinary person uh, from uh, Western Turkey, uh, immigrated with another guy, a friend of his named Marco Melcon, both of them oud players, very good friends. Poulos, every story about him that you hear uh, includes a certain amount of drinking. Um, he ran a kind of a speakeasy around 34th Street and 8th Avenue Cops would come and shut him down, uh, and then he'd reopen right away as soon as he got out of the tombs. Um, this record was a massive hit, probably sold maybe 100,000 copies. This is one of seven or eight copies I've owned over time. Um, yeah, it was $1.25 to get it. And the lyrics are basically, um, let's see, uh, why I came to America, I wandered over here and now I regret it a thousand times over, but it's, uh, it's too late, it can't be helped. I wish I'd never gone, I wish I'd never seen. Darling you, America, I wish I'd never come. So that's why this record sold, because it expressed the ambivalence of people who, you know, had made the choice, they'd come over thinking they were coming to uh, what the Chinese immigrants tongue in cheek referred to as Gold Mountain. America was making, uh, a marketing push all over the world to immigrants to convince them that you know it was streets were paved with gold. That was a line that was used uh, as marketing by steamship companies who were rounding up immigrants and trying to bring them over. It was a big industry, steamship industry. So, for instance, this is a uh, a family photo album from the early twentieth century. Inside, you've got you know pictures of the the family. The outside is a steamship and little American flags and shields all over it. That's the thing that made you American, was the ship coming over. So you make the choice, you come over, and now what? Well, it's complicated. So um, hopefully we'll get to some of those stories, maybe not. Um, I'll tell you that uh, the context for Near Eastern immigrants, let's talk about a little bit. Um, they were eh, exotic for a long time. The first recordings of uh, in the, the Turkish and Arabic languages were made um, at the Columbia World Exposition, September 25th, 1893 at 8.45 in the morning by a, uh, an academic named Benjamin Ives Gilman. Uh, he produced a, a group of uh, cylinder recordings for study purposes of Javanese that were playing and Northwestern Indians and various people but he records seven recordings by four uncredited Turks, uh, two men uh, playing oud, another playing violin, woman playing tambourine, um, and a, a, a quartet uh, from Beirut, uh, including an oudist named Khalil Zakaria, a canonist Meliki Soror, and a percussionist named Maria Lizme, uh, who also gave an oud demonstration. Now, um, those are not recordings that are on the internet. You have to go to the Library of Congress and sit down at a booth in the uh, American Folklife Society to hear them, which I did. Um, they're interesting and there's a lot to be said about them. But one of the interesting things about his notes in them is that the percussionist on them uh, was not named, but was 
said to be only a woman playing tambourine who was a dancer well known at the fair as a star of Constantinople or some other locality. So it may have been Mademoiselle Rosa, or it might have been Farida Mazar Seropoulos, who was born in 1871, died uh, 1937, who was the Syrian wife of a Greek Chicagoan. Um, it may have also been someone else named Little Egypt. Little Egypt was the breakout star of the Columbia World Exposition for several reasons. Number one, she was apparently very good to such an extent that apparently Mark Twain had a heart attack while watching her dance. The dance that she did was then called the Hoochie Coochie Dance. Um, it's now called belly dancing. A lot of what we know or think about Little Egypt comes from a, a private, uh, published, privately published bit of research by a woman named Donna Carlton called Looking for Little Egypt. Um, we don't exactly know who Little Egypt was. There were several people who recorded under the name. Um, but the other reason why she's a significant figure apart from her being this uh, important idea for the Middle East among Americans is that she danced to a song that is still well known among basically all Americans because it goes, Na, 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 there's a place in France where the naked ladies dance. There's a hole in the wall where the boys can see it all. Is the lyrics that I learned on the playground when I was in second grade or something. And that song was composed actually by the 22-year-old entertainment director of the Columbia World Exposition, whose name was Saul Bloom. Saul Bloom is an amazing person, and it's because of Donna Carlton's work in particular that we know much about him. Um, he was born in 1870 in Pekin, Illinois, uh, a son of Jewish Orthodox parents, raised so poor that he only ever attended one day of school is in, in his entire life, went into business for himself, uh, buying and selling stuff, including medicated window screens, which was a total scam. They don't work. Um, but he made so much money that by the age of 19, he was able to buy a ticket for himself to go to Paris for the exposition there. And there he saw uh, Al an Algerian troupe of dancers, female dancers. And he thought to himself, oh my God, I'm going to bring them to America and I'm going to make a million dollars. People are going to lose their minds when they see this, right? So he signs them up right away to a contract, comes back to America, starts trying to book shows, winds up with this job running all of the entertainment at the Columbia World Exposition, and um, yeah, sets up these Near Eastern dancers. And he gives them this song to dance to. It's called The Streets of Egypt, which apparently maybe he stole from a French song, which was stolen from an Algerian song. It's not clear, but that song became the iconic musical shorthand for all of the Middle East. It's in like a ton of cartoons. Whenever you hear that song play, that means somebody's from the Middle East. Anyway, huge song, right? Recording in the Turkish language in the United States doesn't begin commercially for decades later. Uh, February 13th, 1912 at Columbia Record Studios in Manhattan, uh, which is in the Woolworth building. It was then the tallest building in the world. It had uh, six elevators that ran six days a week. People in the basement are shoveling coal to run the elevators all day long, six days a week. Um, and you go up and there Columbia has their studios set up and they're producing at this enormous rate. There are two major record companies in the United States, Columbia and Victor. Uh, Victor Studios mainly are in Camden, New Jersey, but they also have satellite studios in New York. But Columbia studios are right there at the bottom of Manhattan. You can see them from anywhere. And all these immigrants look up at this building and there is a chance to record. And Columbia puts out what they call their E-series starting about 1903, 1904. And they're producing, well, the first thing they do is they start releasing material for the immigrants that was recorded overseas. And they start recording, releasing material for the largest immigrant, immigrant groups there are. So Germans, uh, Italians, and then more and more of the other smaller ethnic groups are having music released for them. And then they start recording material recorded locally by immigrants themselves for the immigrant market. And it works. It doesn't work always right away because the guys who are running the record companies are idiots 
as most people who run record companies are, they think they know what people want and they're wrong because what they think people want to hear is aspiring middle-class music by trained performers, tenors who go, la, 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 la. Malarkey, nobody wants that. People want down-home music like they remember from their village, right? And so this stuff starts prolif proliferating. Columbia is releasing, it's almost two to one music in languages other than English to music in English. Columbia, until 1924, was mainly issuing foreign language music in the United States. Um, so you have people starting to show up and go like, hey, you should be recording us. And one of them is a guy named M.G. Parsekian, an Armenian entrepreneur who had been importing physical discs from overseas to sell to the immigrant market. Uh, music that was recorded in Beirut and Constantinople and Smyrna and uh, selling it to the new immigrants. And he releases, so he goes to Columbia and says, I've got a band. It's like six guys, five guys, um, Armenians and one Assyrian, and they record a bunch of stuff in Turkish for the E-Series in 1912, and it sells. And then for the next three years, Columbia starts releasing more and more stuff in Turkish, some in Armenian, quite a bit in Arabic, as they find other talent. I'm going to play for you now one of the people who first recorded at those 1912 sessions. This is a guy, um, this is a recording from 1916, and it may be the first, it's certainly one of very few recordings in the Kurdish language made in the United States, 1916. Now remember, there were no African-American women recorded commercially in the United States until 1920, when Mamie Smith recorded Crazy Blues for OK Records. But we already had recordings in Kurdish. That's the degree to which there were these massive proliferation of uh, immigrant recordings in the US, um, even as uh, you know, a thousand people a day are coming in through Ellis Island. You know, the record companies know that this stuff could be marketable, could sell. So anyway, this is um, a guy named Kazraf Malul in 1916 in New York. This is the Kurt Havasi. I choose this in particular because one can hear a single word in English, which is America. sense. So as the Ottoman Empire is breaking up and there's uh, uh, massacres going on for decades uh, against the ethnic minorities and the, uh, the religious minorities, Christians and Jews in particular, um, uh, people are fleeing for decades. And that's how the uh, Armenian population in particular winds up 
swelling so rapidly. Uh, there are hundreds, dozens, certainly, of, of really good uh, narratives of the immigrant experience from these places, and I, I collect them actively. Um, I'll just read you a little bit. Of, this is a kind of an oral history called Out of Turkey, uh, which is about the life of uh, one guy named uh, Donik Yesian, Hanik Bey, he was called. Uh, he and his brother uh, left Eastern Anatolia uh, around Diyarbakir, where uh, Khazraf Malul was from, from the same generation. Uh, Malul was born in 1881. Um, these guys go first to the port city of Smyrna and then come to the United States. Um, they get off the boat at Ellis Island and they get into a taxi cab, not speaking any English and not knowing where to go. And the taxi driver speaks just like a little bit of Greek and a little bit of Italian. And they wind up, he winds up dropping them off at a Greek coffee shop. And they wind up from there talking to somebody who offers them, maybe there's a job over here. And that job is basically slave labor. And they walk away from that. And they walk all the way to Massachusetts and they start another job, which is a catastrophe. But here they are in 1910, right off the boat. We rode through the crowded streets, our eyes and ears filled with the unbelievable sights and sound of the great city. Beeping automobiles rushed past horse-drawn carriages, clanging trolleys screeched on steel rails, buildings as tall as mountains seemed to reach to the clouds, movie houses with their bold marquees, one right after the other, lined the streets. Oh, nephew, I can't describe our happy feelings. Electric lights, water faucets, indoor toilets, all of these modern miracles, Irishmen, Englishmen, Frenchmen, Jews, Arabs, Greeks, Spaniards, Germans, Poles, Russians, Chinese, and Italians, all living in harmony and going about their own business. Synagogues and churches of all the people stood in quiet testimony of mutual tolerance. This was surely the land of freedom, the place they called heaven on earth. A few weeks later, he's in a leather factory in Massachusetts where he's dealing with a manager who is uh, raping coworkers during business hours. America, it's complicated. Seems great, it's complicated. Anyway, um, there's a, a really, really great book uh, by a woman named Linda K. Jacobs called Strangers in the West, which is about the Syrian colony in New York in 1880 uh, up until about 1900, it was published in 2015. I highly recommend it. And there's a wonderful talk of hers on the Library of Congress website about the first Syrian family to ever arrive in the United States. Highly recommend this talk. Um, and just to summarize briefly, uh, the family that immigrated was headed by a guy named Yusuf Arbili. He was born in 1825, five miles outside Damascus. Um, he was a college instructor. 1860, he brings his family to Beirut. He founds a, a, a school there for Orthodox Christians. July 1878, he, his wife, six sons and a niece, um, get on a ship. They stop in Paris to go to the Universal, Universal Exposition there. And then they come to the U.S. And in the U.S., they are greeted by the press at the dock. There's word that Syrians are coming. Now, most Americans at this time only own one book. And the fact of the matter is, in your town, there's a guy who has to explain to you what's in that book. The smartest guy in town tells you what it means. But that book happens to take place a lot of it in Syria. Greater Syria at the time was present-day Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, now Israel, right? So there are all these places that people have heard the names of. Damascus. There's a road there, apparently. Somebody had a, an epiphany on that road. Damascus, the Holy Land. These people are coming from where Jesus is from. Oh, my God. So they show up in America, and the press are, you know, meets them. And here's this doctor who speaks English. And the press reports, oh my God, Syrians are amazing. They're great. You're gonna love Syrians, they're so cool. And they wind up immediately getting a job in a mountain town called Maryville, Tennessee, population 1100, where he sets up a, a medical practice. And as a sideline, Joseph Arbeely and two of his sons immediately go on tour. And they start doing tent shows where you can go and for 25 cents uh, uh, for adults, 15 cents for kids, you go in this tent and you can see people from the Holy Land dressed up like Ottoman citizens. They were not the first nor the last Syrians to have uh, had this profession. Here, for instance, is uh, one Princess Rami Haidar. 
uh, is the name that she used, who was a professional touring speaker about being from Syria because Americans wanted to know what it was like being from there. Decades later, in the 1940s, it again became fashionable to be interested in other places and other immigrant groups. So Salam Rizik uh, becomes a touring speaker and publishes this wonderful book that was a bestseller in 1943 called Syrian Yankee about his experience immigrating alone from a little Syrian village to the United States. Um, in that book, um, let's see here. I, I, I see you and I know we're ending soon, so. Uh, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo -doo. There's a quote from Salom Rizik that I want to read to you. Ah, yes. He was born in 1908, comes to the U.S. in 1927, says in 1943, sometimes I think democracy has succeeded too well. It has made success possible for people who did not deserve it. They found freedom here and thought it was only to fill their own selfish desires. They used, or rather abused, that freedom to achieve power. And now they want to use their power to destroy that freedom. Sound familiar? Okay, I'm gonna end uh, not by playing you uh, Alexander Malouf as I had hoped to do because I yammer on too much, but I've released Dozens and dozens of hours of recordings uh, online. They're widely available. There's no sense in me playing everything. I've written a lot about this stuff. Canary-records.bandcamp.com. There is so much to share and so much I want to tell you. What I'll do is I'll share with you a little bit about uh, Anzia Yezierska, who is sort of the patron saint of a lot of my work. This is from her first book, Children of Loneliness. She wrote in 1920 in Good Housekeeping Magazine. When the editor told me that he would give me my chance to speak to Americans out of my heart and to say freely, not what I ought to feel, not what the Americans didn't want me to feel, but what I actually do feel, something broke loose inside me, a tightness that had held me strained like one whose fists are clenched, resisting, resisting, resisting what? Had I not come to America with open outstretched arms, all my earthly possessions tied up in a handkerchief and all of the hopes of humanity singing in my heart, had I not come to join hands with all of the thousands of dreamers who had gone before me in search of the golden land. As I rushed forward with hungry eagerness to meet the expected welcoming, the very earth danced beneath my feet. All that I was, all that I had, I held out in my bare hands to America, the beloved prayed for land, but no hand was held out to meet mine. My eyes burned with longing, seeking, seeking for a comprehending glance, where are the dreamers, cried my heart, my hands dropped down, my gifts unwanted. I found no dreamers in America. I found rich men, poor men, educated men, ignorant men, struggling, all struggling for bread, for rent, for banks, for mines, rich and poor, educated and ignorant, straining, straining, wearing out their bodies, their brains for the possession of things, money, power, position, their dreams forgotten. I found in this rich land, man still fighting man as in the poorest part of the old country, just as the starving Romanian Jews who had nothing to eat in their homeland, but herring, when they became millionaires, still ate herring from golden plates at banquets. So throughout America, the dollar fight that grew up like a plague in times of poverty, killing the souls of men still goes on in times of plenty. I had expected to work in America, but work at something I loved, work with my mind and my heart, prepared for my work by education. I dreamed of free schools, free colleges, where I could learn to give out my inmost thoughts and feelings to the world. But no sooner did I come off the ship than hunger drove me to the sweatshop to become a hand, not a brain, not a soul, not a spirit, just a hand cramped, deadened into part of a machine, a hand fit only to grasp and not to give. So the Johnson-Reed Act that restricted immigration by quotas from each part of the world where, by the way, uh, the number of immigrants allowed in between 1924 and 1965 from Asia and Africa was zero, lasted for 40 years. So if you were born in the 1940s, you grew up in the most homogeneous monolingual culture that America ever had. And if you saw the waves of immigrants that arrived in the 1970s and 80s, you saw, again, America change color, change culture. 
as people came from Asia and Africa. And if you are my father's generation, the president's generation, you look at this and say, this is not my America. This is not the America that I know and I grew up in. Because the America you know and grew up in was the most backward racist America that there ever was. And it's not who we are or what we represent truly. It's not the one represented by the new Colossus and Emma Lazarus. It's not the one that all of these other people uh, gave to us on records. Anyway, thanks so much for listening. I'm sorry to yammer on so long. There's so much music available that um, I, I hope we can share. Thanks again. Y'all take care.